Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx and to who is now join, joining us on Facebook Live. The Geneva Environment Network and the International Union for Conservation of Nature have the pleasure to welcome you today virtually for the third session of the Geneva Dialogues on Nature-Based uh, Solutions. The event today will focus on the post-2020 biodiversity framework. As you will hear from our guests and from our moderator, the Nature-Based Solutions Dialogues aimed up to facilitate further engagement and discussion among the stakeholders in International Geneva and beyond in the lead up to, critical, uh, to a critical year for nature and society. Our Nature-Based Solution journey is co-convened with IUCN. IUCN has its headquarters in our region and is an essential global actor bringing together the world's most influential organizations and experts to conserve nature and accelerate the transition to a sustainable world. We have again the pleasure to have some leading experts from the network with us today. Before I give the floor to Dr. James Smart, uh, Global Director of uh, the Biodiversity Conservation Group and the Global Species Program at IUCN, who will guide you through our session today, let me briefly mention for those who wouldn't yet know the Geneva Environment Network that we are a network of uh, more than 100 institutions and secretariats based in Geneva that make this region one of the global hubs for environmental governance. Administrated by the United Nations Environment Program and supported by Switzerland, we organize various networking activities, including regular multi-stakeholder roundtables and briefings on major environmental trends. Let me also remind you that uh, the documents presented today, the summary, as well as the video of the dialogue, will be made available on the web page of this event. With this, Jane, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Diana, and welcome from me too to this special dialogue um, on nature-based solutions and the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. This is a very timely dialogue given that we have um, a key negotiation meeting for the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework coming up. And the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, of course, is eliciting a lot of excitement around the world right now, because along with health and climate change, which are also on everybody's minds, biodiversity is the, the third piece of this, this extremely important puzzle, absolutely essential to propping up our life support systems. So um, as I just mentioned, the Open Ended Working Group is coming up. It comes up at, in late August on the 23rd of August, so quite soon really. And just after that, we head into IUCN's World Conservation Congress. So it is in ve indeed very timely. Um, before I proceed with a few more remarks on nature-based solutions, I just wanted to mention I'm going to introduce the panel a little bit later on, but we do have apologies from one of our panelists, Lucy Molenkai, Executive Director of the Indigenous Information Network, and also from David Cooper, who's um, replaced by Catalina Santa Maria, and we're delighted to welcome her. So I will just say a little bit more about um, nature-based solutions, and then, as I say, you will hear from our panelists. So if I could have my slide, please, Diana. And the next one, please. Thank you very much. So, so just a few remarks that I think and believe will be picked up by our panelists. Um, we're going to be looking at how nature based solutions could contribute to the finally adopted post 2020 global biodiversity framework, which, after all, must succeed in halting the net loss of biodiversity by 2030. That's certainly IUCN's position so that it can truly contribute to the vision by 2050 of living in harmony with nature. Now, nature-based solutions are a phrase, I think, with real resonance, and I think that's why they've been picked up as a phrase all around the world and in all sorts of venues. It's just one of those phrases that when you hear it, you remember it really. And at the same time, there's quite a little bit of discussion and even controversy around the phrase, which I hope we're going to get to today in our discussions. It's been mentioned in the recent IPBES meeting and in the recent virtual CBD meetings. And I'm sure, as I say, we'll hear more about that. And I think, you know, it's very good that it's been picked up and is being discussed because it means that people will, I think, remember it. 
But at the same time, there's a downside to that interest in it because we've got to make sure people use it in the right way and don't misuse it, actually, because that's really not helpful. Um, but from the IUCN point of view, we do see it as a key piece of the puzzle for ensuring sustainable large scale protection and restoration of nature. And it can benefit both people and nature from a biodiversity conservation point of view. It's grounded in the ecosystem approach, as, as one of our speakers is going to talk about. And I should say that the global standard for nature based solutions was adopted just last year to provide robust environmental and biodiversity safeguards in relation to nature and indeed human rights. And it guarantees, if applied properly and correctly, fair and inclusive governance and decision making, which is of real relevance to the post 2020 framework. It can relate to all three objectives of the CB, not just not just conservation. And um, going back to 2016, IUCN's World Conservation Congress in Hawaii, we adopted a recognized definition through a resolution which was actually adopted by our state and NGO members at that meeting. And here's one key point I want to make that you know, there are eight criteria, as you will hear, and but number three addresses net positive impact on biodiversity. If applied correctly, the result will always be net positive, and I really want to stress that point. And in so doing, of course, it will therefore contribute to the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. So now it is um, a great pleasure to introduce our speakers. I do have one more slide which shows you how it is currently. Um, oh, well, there's the definition. There's our definition of nature based solutions, and I'm sure our speakers will be showing this. And this one more slide, you can just go to the next one because we'll come back to this definition. These um, highlighted in bold on this slide are the current mentions of nature based solutions in the updated zero draft in relation to the actual 2030 action targets. The current updated zero draft is the current version of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework soon to be um, amended as a result of the recent sessions. Um, the next, I'm sure Catalina is going to tell us from the CBD, but coming up in, in early to mid July, we will have the next version and we'll see what's happened to the whole concept of nature based solutions there. But the current target seven contains a mention of nature based solutions in relation to climate change, mitigation, adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Um, I won't read out the whole the whole target because you can see it there and we're going to come back to this under the heading of reducing threats to biodiversity under the heading of meeting people's needs through sustainable use and benefit sharing. Um, target 10 is aiming to ensure that by 2030 and the, and the ecosystem approach contribute to regulation of air quality hazards and extreme events and quality and quantity of water for at least and then we have a certain number of people in square brackets but this is a draft post 2020 global biodiversity framework and there's a long way to go before we get to the final the final framework thank you and uh, many of our uh, panelists to be elaborating on these points. So I think um, that's it with the PowerPoint. And let me now introduce the panelists. I'm going to introduce them all at the beginning and then I'll um, introduce them one by one as they make their interventions. So it is a great pleasure, firstly, to introduce um, Catalina Santa Maria, who's special advisor to the executive secretary of um, the UN CBD. Thank you very much for joining us, Catalina. We're looking forward to hearing about all the updates on the post 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework, nature based solutions. Norbert um, Barlocka is head Rio Convention section of the Federal Office for the Environment in Switzerland. Picture to come up. Well, Okay, I'm going to carry on. We'll hear from Camilla Zipada 
Nizama, Director General of Global Issues at the Mexican Secretariat of Foreign Relations. And then we'll hear from Pauli Pretorius, Deputy Director of uh, one of our key partners, UNEP WCMC. And last but by no means least, one of the, the, the brains behind nature-based solutions in IUCN, Angela Andrade, of Environmental Policy at Conservation International and Chair of the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management. Um, now, these um, panelists have a very difficult task because they're going to make their in, in just five minutes each. Um, and as we go through, please put your questions to our panelists in the chat. And what we'll be doing at the end of um, hearing from these five experts We'll have a, a good open discussion and obviously we want to allow a good time for discussion because this is such a, an interesting issue that's evoked such a lot of response and also questions as i said earlier so we'll have a good interactive dialogue going so from from the chat so please do feel free to put your questions there either in relation to a panelist in particular or more generally and then finally before we wrap up on time of course We'll be asking each panelist to give their one key away message that we will all be remembering. Good, so that's what we've got ahead of us this afternoon. Um, so with no more delay, let me ask Catalina Santa, um, working very close with the Executive Secretary to the CBD, uh, uh, CBD Executive Secretary, let me ask her for her intervention. And we're all fascinated to hear what she's going to say. Thank you so much, Jane. It's a pleasure for us uh, to be participating in this event, and we express our appreciation to the government of Switzerland, the Geneva Environmental Network, U UNEP, IUCN for organizing this session, and to all the panelists and participants that are joining today. On behalf of Mr. David Cooper, the Deputy Executive Secretary of the CBD, it's a pleasure for me to share this update on the COP15 preparations and to contribute to the discussions on the role of nature-based solutions. Two weeks ago, delegates to the CBD process concluded the first formal virtual part of negotiations under the subsidiary body meetings. This is a critical step in the lead up to COP15. Delegates not only advanced the work of the subsidiary bodies, but also produced important advice to the co-chairs of the working group on the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Work will continue virtually in the third meeting of the working group on the post-2020 framework that's scheduled for the 23rd of August to the 3rd of September. At that meeting, delegates will work on the basis of the first draft, currently being prepared by the co-chairs, which is building upon the earlier drafts and the discussions of SEPSTA and SBI. It is anticipated that a physical meeting will be needed to complete the work of the working group and the subsidiary bodies before the final version of the framework being presented for adoption at COP15. The COP Bureau is meeting in the coming days to develop the timetable for this meeting and for plans for COP itself. Clearly, such plans will need to ensure effective preparation and convening of COP15 with full participation of all stakeholders. Now, turning to nature-based solutions, which is the main focus of today's discussion. As you are aware, nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches feature prominently in the discussions around the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, and indeed are reflected in a number of draft targets in the zero draft and in the updated zero draft. And Jane, you referred to two of those in your slides. Nature-based solutions are often discussed in relation to climate change, and there's strong action to keep climate change well below 2 degrees Celsius and close to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. We know this is needed to prevent climate impacts from overwhelming all other actions in support of biodiversity. Conservation and restoration of ecosystems can play a substantial role in these efforts. And as illustrated in the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, such nature-based solutions could provide about one-third of the total net emission reduction effort required to keep climate change close to 1.5 degrees Celsius. With the appropriate safeguards, they could also enhance a wide range of ecosystem services, including water infiltration, 
flood and coastal protection and soil health, as well as contributing to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. However, there are four important caveats to use of nature-based solutions or ecosystem-based approaches. Firstly, while they are an essential part of the solution, the climate problem cannot be solved without stringent reductions in the use of fossil fuels. Secondly, the distributional impacts must be considered and indigenous people and local communities must be fully involved in the development and implementation of ecosystem-based approaches. Thirdly, while many ecosystem-based approaches have co-benefits for biodiversity, this is not always the case and careful assessment of synergies and trade-offs is required. In particular, tree planting is not always appropriate, especially non-native species in monoculture plantations. Fourthly, climate change impacts can undermine ecosystem resilience and thus weaken the contribution of ecosystems to both mitigation and adaptation of climate change. It is essential that these caveats be kept in mind and that only efforts that truly contribute to social objectives in a just manner while protecting biodiversity are counted as true nature-based solutions. Clearly, ecosystem-based approaches and nature-based solutions also go beyond climate mitigation and adaptation. They are interconnected with other key issues such as sustainable agriculture, <clears throat> the provision of clean air and water, green infrastructure, and urban green spaces. As the fifth edition of the GBO5 reports, transformations need to be achieved in the production of goods and services, especially food. This includes adopting agricultural methods that can meet growing global demand while imposing fewer negative impacts on the environment and reducing the pressure to convert more land to production. It also means limiting the demand for increased food production by adopting healthier diets, reducing food waste, and addressing the consumption of other material goods and services affecting biodiversity. The deployment of green infrastructure and making space for nature within built landscapes to improve the health and quality of life for citizens also needs to be factored. Here we must recognize the dependency of urban communities on well-functioning ecosystems. Teleconnections between cities and nearby and distant ecosystems and spatial planning to reduce the negative impacts on biodiversity from urban expansion, roads, and other infrastructure are critical for a green cities and infrastructure transition. So in closing, looking ahead, it will be critical for nature-based solutions to leverage broad action, recognizing the value of biodiversity and enhancing or restoring the functionality of ecosystems on which all aspects of human activity depend. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very rich contribution. I think you show that actually it can be quite a technical issue I mean, in relation to how this is applied. And um, I won't ask you to comment on this, but I think you are dropping us quite a strong hint that nature-based solutions might well still be in the, in the 1.0 draft that is coming. Welcome that, obviously. So thanks for that. Um, and no doubt there's going to be questions. But now we will move on to, to Norbert, who's going to be talking about nature-based solutions for accelerating transformative change in mainstreaming biodiversity and strengthening synergies amongst the multilateral environmental agreements. Norbert, please. Berlina's um, intervention showed how technical that um, environment policy can be. My title shows how abstract it can be. It contains uh, four <laughs> terms that uh, uh, in itself are, are quite abstract. Synergies, mainstreaming, the nature-based solution as such, and the transformative change. I would like to start with transformative change and recall when in 2016 in the outer skirt of Geneva, we had the first uh, Boji Bosse meeting and we were reflecting what comes after 2020, the post 2020, when the IG targets will, will phase out and, um, and the strategic plan that we adopted that some years uh, earlier. And at that time, I remember that the then executive um, director, uh, secretary uh, of the CBD said, we need something that makes pollution or to disregard nature unmoral or immoral, unmoral, how do you say it? Like smoking. She always said, we have to 
achieve that in society, it is not accepted that somebody pollutes nature. And uh, we tried to give this, this, um, this idea a name and, and came up already uh, five years ago with this transformative change, probably in chains mind and a discussion this existed already but for me it was the first time that I, I heard this transformative change and um, I was quite pleased when I read the IPES global assessment where transformative change again has a very prominent place in, in it and it, it, it clearly states that um, we have to make sure that our production and our consumption is not harmful for, for nature. And this is easily said and everybody agrees on it, but um, it hurts. It hurts when you imagine how we produce many of our products, how the way how we consume, how we travel, how we live. It almost always is linked with a negative impact on, on nature. So if governments should now stand up and say, OK, we have to change our behavior. We have to change our ways of producing and con uh, and, and consume uh, things, then uh, people, uh, they might feel it. They, they, they will they will um, not necessarily be, be very happy about that. And I always remember when um, President Macron in France, he took office, one of his uh, first measures he wanted to introduce was to raise the gas price because he said uh, climate change needs that uh, we are more responsible using the car and um, shift towards uh, public transport. And, and, and what he saw was the reaction of the, of the Yellow Wests. So um, transformative change is something that, as I said, that hurt and uh, needs a lot of um, planning and a lot of political will to um, make sure that we are ready to shift from the way how we produce things, how we consume uh, to a more sustainable and in, in, in harmony with, with nature. Now, nature-based solutions was for me a kind of an answer to to uh, what I clearly felt in, in, the, um, in the discussion in the climate change. Um, many countries, they were exactly afraid of the transformative change. So they wanted to focus on technology. So not change your behavior, but just develop a new technology so that you can continue your normal consumption and your normal um, production and your traveling and, and your production of food. Uh, just focus on, on a technology, a technology answer and it. Uh, and sometimes it's true. I have been visiting a year ago um, a factory near Zurich that is uh, taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere and produces kerosene. So there would be a kind of circular economy for our planes. It, it is possible. You need a lot of energy, of electric energy, uh, but it, it is possible. Uh, so technology can be a, a part of, of, of the answer. But uh, sometimes um, it is certainly um, not, not the right way to go. And I always remember in, in, in Paris when we adopted uh, the, the Paris Agreement, uh, my neighbor was from Suriname, Swiss is Suriname, we are neighbors, and he told me that in Suriname they have a problem that uh, a lot of sediment that comes from uh, the Amazon River um, is, is, is the waves um, going into the land and, and of, of Suriname. And uh, so he had an idea of, um, of, of planting mangroves and the mangroves just would uh, hold back the sediments and the kind of natural dam would grow up. When more sediments come, the mangrove would grow on the top of it. But his government wanted to build a dam with concrete. And it was clearly linked to economy, to business partners, to an approach of technicians who don't really listen to nature, but who come up with some technical, um, often concrete and, and ha with a heavy impact on nature. So this was for me an eye opener and I said, really, we have to uh, learn again something that um, that our ancestors knew and that uh, also the indigenous people uh, still know. So if Lucy today uh, cannot be with us, uh, I think it's also something we, we also owe tribute to the, to the indigenous people who they they know what at the long term nature 
can offer us and how we can use nature in order to um, not uh, have a strong impact even even if we want to have uh, the economy uh, going well. Now, the resistance came, uh, as, as has been said also by, by Jane, uh, from the biodiversity uh, community. And uh, you mentioned the uh, also, uh, you mentioned the example of the eucalyptus uh, monoculture plantation uh, to absorb CO2. Catalina was mentioning it. Um, of course, this is not the right, the right uh, approach. And therefore, I am very happy that uh, IUCN developed not only a methodology on, on how to use uh, these uh, nature-based solutions, but also standards. And I'm glad that these are experts uh, have done it because I can imagine, and Catalina as well, if we would have to negotiate these standards, we would need five more years to agree on, uh, on, on, on standards uh, among negotiators. So we should be happy if experts uh, within um, bodies like, like IUCN, uh, they can have a, a very rational approach to it and can offer uh, their findings to uh, to the processes like like the CBD. Now, uh, the mainstreaming is something that uh, Mexico uh, was pushing uh, in the, at their COP we had uh, some years ago in Cancun. And it is quite evident that uh, we cannot save biodiversity by creating um, protected areas. Uh, the impact and the IPIS global assessment also showed it. The impact on biodiversity comes from different sectors and uh, we have to address biodiversity concerns within these sectors. So mainstreaming has become um, uh, something very important, but it's still an uphill struggle. And um, I um, recall uh, the anecdote of uh, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the now CEO of uh, Jeff. Uh, when he took the plane, he met a minister of the Costa Rican uh, government and he asked him where he was heading to. Are you heading to a CBD conference? And uh, the minister for agriculture said, oh, no, I will go to the UNFCCC meeting. And for him, it was also an eye opener that many ministers from other sectors, they attend climate change COPs, but not necessarily biodiversity COPs even if probably we would need their understanding their collaboration much more because as, as it has been said um, these impacts come from other sectors so we have to integrate uh, these sectors but why why is it like this i think it, it is like this because climate change is first of all direct the economic impact is is very evident by diversity it's more difficult to understand uh, that at the end there is also a price tag on on the destruction of of nature and the second um, argument is something that um, is is a fact that we have one unf triple c process but we have many other meas uh, that deal with biodiversity it's always a little bit the diversity of the biodiversity world that looks like a spring meadow with a lot of flowers and that's certainly nice and it's a fact but we have to agree that uh, ministers will not attend many of the COPs because there are so many processes uh, that they cannot uh, attend all of them. And at the end, um, visibility and political um, agenda setting is, is, is still difficult for, for the biodiversity world. So we have to work together, and this is the last term that synergies um, means that we work together with all the MEAs that can contribute to the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. And um, as it has been said, this is not only the biodiversity related conventions, but also others like uh, uh, climate, but uh, we also heard that it has an impact on agriculture, on health. So FAO is also, of course, um, in, in the boat. And uh, synergies will bring all these MEAs together and hopefully we will be able within uh, the a COP to adopt um, a, me a, me a mechanism that allows all the MEAs uh, to contribute to it and also to report on it. It's very important that we create a platform where all this information uh, can be put on one platform, is transparent uh, and doesn't um, need more reporting. We just put all the reports in the different processes on one uh, platform and uh, this allows us to see how synergetically we can implement the new global biodiversity framework 
all together in an integrative manner. Thank you, Jane. Thank you so much, Norbert. I, and I think it's really important that you emphasize the transformative change in relation to mainstreaming, because I think nature-based solutions could really help with that. And, and I'd also remark that although, of course, the global biodiversity framework has got to be a work of science, it's also got to be a work of art. And if it does, it truly will allow the other MEAs to see themselves in there and contribute to it and report against it. And I actually think it will help the CBD as kind of the leader in this game to, to, to help push it, help get implementation, help help everybody take it seriously. So thanks very much for those remarks. So now let's um, go to Camilla Zipada Lizama, Director General of Global Issues at the Mexican Secretariat of Foreign Relations. She's going to talk about nature-based solutions, an integrated response for achieving the 2050 vision. Quite a big thought there. Over to you, Camilla. Thank you very much, Jane, and thank you to the Geneva Environment Network and the government of Switzerland for carrying out this event. I feel extremely honored to be counted as among such uh, prestigious and committed panelists. And uh, following up on the discussion, uh, Catalina has already uh, mentioned the technical part, and Norbert, the abstract uh, science and the state of art. And so now I will focus on the political will needed and the public policies needed uh, to foster uh, nature-based solutions. And uh, so I, I hope to, to shed some light uh, into some of the work that uh, the government of Mexico and more importantly, our subnational governments are carrying out, carrying out uh, to fully implement uh, uh, all this uh, post 2020 uh, biodiversity framework and specifically nature based solutions. And, and as such, you might have heard already about uh, the Edinburgh uh, Declaration. And in that sense, um, I have to say that. Uh, since Mexico has been advocating uh, for an essential role of cities and local authorities within the implementation of the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, we were the first party to sign this declaration. And we believe it is a very powerful instrument uh, to enhance uh, and collectively increase ambition for uh, the post-2020 implementation. And uh, we're currently working with them. I can't already uh, say many specifics because it's under construction, uh, but uh, we do seek uh, to, to promote collaboration and capacity development among our subnational governments, cities and local authorities. Um, we're working with, when, with them um, to present some uh, additional commitments and on how uh, we can have this particip participative mechanism uh, to strengthen environmental governments within different sectors and stakeholders. And more importantly, um, we're searching on innovative financial mechanisms that uh, could bring multilateral cooperation, attention, and also co-finance interest to develop successful cons conservation and restoration projects that do include uh, nature-based solutions. And this has been a specific obstacle that we have seen uh, across the world is that uh, it's easy to get uh, funding for federal governments. Well, not easy, but at least there is uh, funding for federal governments. But that task is incredibly harder for local authorities to have those financial resources that are needed, uh, mainly because a lot of, of, of their uh, cities and their authorities are the ones that are actually implementing in the ground nature-based solutions. So we need also to have that... Uh, sort of uh, alignment between uh, multilateral uh, agencies, between regional development banks, and then local authorities uh, to streamline those, those resources. And in, in the end, if we want to fulfill those Edinburgh Declaration goals, well, we need the resources uh, to go to, to those projects. And as, as mentioned in the beginning, uh, Mexico is, is a, a very strong supporter of nature-based solutions and uh, any plans also related to an ecosystem-based approach uh, to ensure respect for nature. Um, we have uh, been uh, very vocal on it on, on all of the multilateral agenda, uh, particularly last year um, we, we co-shared uh, with uh, Canada and led an action track of nature-based solutions 
on the, the Global Commission on Adaptation, which was a one uh, period, uh, one year period of effort and that culminated in the adapter, adaptation summit that happened uh, last uh, January. And within this uh, framework, we organized a dialogue of indigenous peoples, climate and not climate change, uh, biodiversity and desertification, uh, with a special focus on nature based solutions uh, to delve in how um, indigenous people perceived, and as you said, uh, they have a very different definition than we do. And for them, oh, everything is a nature based solution and should be a nature based solution approach. And uh, this was a very interesting uh, dialogue. Uh, whose results uh, we are um, presenting to each of the three Rio conventions as we believe we need to follow up and uh, make sure, as, as has already been mentioned, to have those synergies between the three different uh, conventions and not just um, mention it in the CBD uh, uh, discussions and negotiations, but uh, we need to, to bring the nature-based solutions focus and, and that it is helpful for all climate and environmental related matters. And so we, we are very happy to see that, as you said, Jane, uh, this catchy uh, word of nature based solutions ha have been now gaining attention. And uh, for example, in the uh, G20 Italian Presidencies Initiative, there has uh, been a strong support for nature based solution in global climate actions. Uh, so, uh, not only the biodiversity and the, and the environment track, but also within the, the climate uh, uh, working group, um, there has been uh, an effort to include nature based solutions um, uh, as, as a, a way to tackle climate change. So, so we're very happy to see now that uh, further engagement. Uh, but do, we do believe that uh, now uh, we have uh, this, uh, these ideas in the multilateral agenda, we need to make sure that uh, they go into the ground, that they go into public policies, and that uh, all the legal frameworks are aligned. So in that sense, um, I'm happy to say that, uh, for example, in Mexico, we have included a nature-based solutions as a, a very strong part of our um, NDC, our National Determined Contribution for the UNFCCC um, uh, framework. And also, we have incorporated nature-based solutions in our national adaptation policy, and it's also contained in our general law of climate change. Um, so we are um, aiming at uh, generating specific concrete actions. I mean, Norbert has already mentioned about mangroves. I mean, that, that's a, a huge uh, project in Mexico. You and uh, I, I mean, I, I can't. I don't need to repeat. I think everyone here understands uh, that that power. But uh, so definitely, uh, we see that there are very uh, opportunities to scale up uh, this these solutions to restore ecosystem and habitats, lands are soil recovery, carbon capture and storage, and all all of those also poverty reduction. And so we're we're very happy that um, nature based solutions are are gaining momentum and. We do believe that it is fundamental uh, to create the synergies that that we have been mentioning, and in that sense, it is helpful that uh, from our part, um, and I'm happy to say that uh, my my office specifically covers all the three Rio conventions, and so we have been uh, very vocal on bringing this idea uh, across uh, the three Rio conventions and making sure that it gets the attention it deserves. Um, and that it, it, we believe it is a, a, a good way forward um, for all the global challenges that we face. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Camilla, and thanks for stressing the important role of indigenous peoples and their viewpoints in relation to this, this debate, you know, where Mexico often takes such a great lead, and we always appreciate that. Thank you. Um, in addition, you, you mentioned the importance of, you know, reaching city dwellers. Um, including through um, innovative financial mechanisms. So I think that's another piece of the puzzle, really. And, you know, which speaks to what Norbert mentioned about, you know, how do we reach the wider public who don't necessarily want to stop consuming and all the rest of it, or don't necessarily see the importance of that. But you covered many issues there. Thank you very much for that. So now let's move on to Corley, Corley Pretorius from UNEP WCMC, who's going to be talking about 
the UN Common Approach on Biodiversity and Nature-Based Solutions. Paulie, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Jane, and good afternoon, uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, many thanks to the Geneva Environment Network for organizing this series and, and inviting me to this panel today also. I would like to share three insights about the UN Common Approach to Biodiversity, and if you will forgive me, this happens when you later down in the panel discussion, I'm going to pick up on things that Camila mentioned, Norbert mentioned, Catalina mentioned, so um, I think we, we are very much in alignment, and also what you said in the beginning to open the session, Jane. Um, the common approach that we have adopted, or that the, the chief executives or the executive heads of the agencies uh, adopted at the spring meeting of the CEB is really a mainstreaming agenda. And it's also about the UN system support to member states to implement the CBD and other um, multilateral environmental agreements. So the three things that I would like to, to highlight. Firstly, reflect on the SG's vision and leadership by requesting a whole of UN system approach to biodiversity, and therefore also signaling the need for supporting integrated approaches across governments. Secondly, focus on the implementation at the national level, but at the same time, identify key systemic levers or barriers to, to change. And thirdly, appreciate that the integration of biodiversity and nature-based approaches also require the phasing out of economic activity that degrades nature. And this is what Norbert has also spoken about, the transitions, those socioeconomic transitions. But let's start with the whole of UN system and the whole of government approach. As we know, biodiversity underpins our economies and our well-being. It ensures sustainable livelihoods, supports 1.2 billion jobs directly, billions more indirectly, and studies show that half of the world's global economy is moderately or highly dependent on functioning ecosystems. And conversely, as Catalina has said, when these are degraded or they unravel, it impacts, has enormous social impact on different communities in a very differentiated way. Among many recent assessments, the fifth edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, released in September last year, um, also indicated that the global ad ambition to address the three pillars of sustainable development is limited by siloed approaches, where the value of biodiversity and ecosystem services are largely unaccounted and disconnected from socioeconomic priorities. That's the first message that is also captured in the UN Common Approach to Biodiversity, is that we require actions across the whole of government and society to address nature loss and to integrate uh, biodiversity considerations and nature-based solutions. These will help us to address the direct and underlying causes of biodiversity loss and help us with that transformation of our economies, set us on a different pathway. Secondly, the focus on implementation and the identification of key system levers. As Camilla said, really important to get to all tiers of government in terms of the implementation through the common approach the UN system expressed a shared recognition of the urgency to act and a commitment to mainstream through better coordinated efforts to facilitate implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, but also linked to the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement. For example, the, we have not only the sectoral or across uh, sectors integration, we also looked at vertical coherence, UN country teams and UN residents coordinators will support member states to implement the decisions of multilateral environmental agreements. And they are various instruments that we have as UN teams to, to do so, looking at supporting policy coherence, institutional capacity, but also things such as multi-stakeholder processes and brokering those difficult ways forward where we need to bring different economic interests together. There are also larger systemic issues to address, which are part of our global system. For example, markets, economic and financial practices need to be fundamentally reformed to consider biodiversity and nature-based solutions. Such reform includes using metrics for governments and the private sector and society that measure progress towards sustainable development 
and that are supported by strengthened commitments to conserve and restore natural capital. And these are some of the dialogues that the UN can convene, bringing different parts of our global institutional architecture together as well. They was also a key message in the 2020 Human Development Report that now is the time for all countries to redesign their paths to progress by fully accounting for the pressures human puts on the planet and by working towards activities that generate a net positive effect on nature. And this is exactly the third message. Those socioeconomic transitions that Norbert referred to, they are required to reset our relationship with nature. These transitions require proactive support of green economy approaches, creating decent jobs and ecosystem resilience. And by doing so, also ensuring disaster risk reduction, including those related to environmental change and pandemics. And I think Angela might speak to that. Your, your guidance that you've put out, Jane, is really full of practical examples on how some of nature-based solutions can be applied to achieve this. One example that was also referenced by Catalina earlier is the current unsustainability of our food systems. And thinking about what Camilla said and Norbert about the synergies across the different conventions, food systems are associated with many of the direct drivers of biodiversity loss through land use change, large scale monoculture of a handful of major food crops, over exploitation of fisheries, the impacts of excess nutrients, use of chemicals, food waste and loss, generation of greenhouse gases. So these, if you can imagine, bringing all of those systemic cha challenges together, this is what we mean when we're talking about transformation of systems. The socioeconomic transitions will also require changing societal perceptions. So we depend as much on the producers as on the consumers to drive this change. And as consumers, societies, we need to value and conserve biodiversity. In the world of work, skills for a greener future remain a priority, and that needs to influence our, our education and our skilling, reskilling programs as well. These might include skills to accelerate the energy transition and the transformation of other trans extractive sectors to create resilience through natural resource management. And very importantly, in the next decade, we have a big emphasis on ecosystem restoration, of course. In closing, we are now in a moment in history to reflect on cooperation and the choices we need to make to tackle these global systemic risks and challenges and how our societies can be reshaped as part of a resilient and sustainable recovery from the pandemic. As the UN system through the common approach, we have to design the outlines of collective act action and cooperation across sectors to support member states to achieve that just that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Corley. I think you've painted quite a vision there. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I'm not going to ask them right now because we. <laughs> but thank you very much for that. It's very, very thought provoking. Um, and as you pointed out, I, I think these presentations are very nicely complementing each other. We've got a very big picture painted. But now let's hear from um, Angela Andrade, who is chair of IUCN's Commission on Ecosystem Management on the ecosystem approach and nature-based solutions. Um, and I, I believe that she's going to be picking up on some of the interesting discussions that have taken place around the issue of nature-based solutions that I mentioned at the beginning. And well, I, for one, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing, hearing um, where the rubber hits the road on all this. So over to you, Angela. Please go ahead. Uh, sorry, I thought that I, I missed the the connection, but um, yeah. So I, I have, I have a, a very um, a short presentation. So the first point that that uh, I wanted to highlight is that. Um, as we all know, the ecosystem approach uh, was adopted by the Convention on Biological Diversity in the year 2000, 
And uh, one of the main uh, of the purposes of the, of the ecosystem approach, as was already highlighted by Jane and, and by some of you, uh, is the, the importance of uh, addressing in an integrated manner the objectives of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And after uh, the ecosystem approach was adopted, uh, the um, Commission on Ecosystem Management, together with the IUCN and many other organizations, uh, started with the development of some practical applications of the ecosystem approach. And we have uh, applications to different areas, to different sectors. Uh, we have a lot of experiences, for example, in ecosystem-based approaches to fisheries, to human health. But um, and since 2008, uh, the uh, approach that was mainly um, known, and it was already referred by some of you, was the ecosystem-based approaches to climate change adaptation. And uh, as we all know, uh, these applications have been very popular and have been um, mainstream in many areas. And we all know uh, these days about um, the extent to which ecosystem-based approaches can contribute to address climate change impacts. Uh, however, all these um, applications, uh, and, and that's um, one of the main comments that we have for many people, that the ecosystem approach seemed to be quite technical and difficult to understand, especially for people outside the conservation community. And uh, so, uh, as we all know, the ecosystem approach is, is, uh, provides very good scientific basis and understanding of the connections between uh, ecosystems and societies, including culture and all these topics. Uh, one important point to, 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 to consider is the difficulty that we had during these years to really use this concept uh, uh, and, and for mainstreaming and engaging other people, especially uh, the private sector and, and people um, in, the, in areas outside the conservation communities. So this is one of the reasons of why the whole concept of nature-based solutions became uh, so let's say popular and uh, as we know it's, it's a kind of operational approach to uh, address the global societal challenges and this definition as was mentioned already was adopted by IUCN members in 2016 so that means that there are almost 20 years be uh, between the adoption of the ecosystem approach and the definition and nature-based solutions what I want to highlight is that they are complementary they they are not replacing one to each other because they have different backgrounds they have um different objectives and uh, we still have the ecosystem approach uh, producing a lot of research literature and applications but the main topic that i want to highlight regarding nature-based solutions is the need to address all these challenges in an integrated manner because we have uh, and that has been recalled by by some of you, we are living in a very urgent situation where biodiversity loss, uh, ecosystem degradation and climate change are becoming one of the main challenges that we ever had. And we need to respond in, in an integrated manner uh, immediately, let's say. So this approach provides a practical way to introduce all this ecosystem uh, approach thinking to solve these problems and really to build this um, a community of practice on on implementation on nature-based solutions we can go to the first uh, next one please so uh, all the um, the next slide uh, the the definitions that i presented here are not um, not uh, they are not uh, alone. No, they are not coming alone. They are. Um, they come together with a, a set of principles, and as has uh, as it has been highlighted already, uh, also uh, by Jane and others, um, the MBS approach is built upon the good experiences of coming from the applications of the ecosystem approach. Um, 
ecosystem-based approaches and other related uh, actions like uh, ecosystem restoration, like uh, forest landscape restoration, but most importantly, the importance of considering hybrid approaches, because this is where the, this kind of conservation-related actions are connecting with uh, other actions that have been implemented by uh, other agencies where we need to build this, this Bridges. So, uh, as you can see, uh, the the principles that we have, um, and this is part of the analysis that uh, gave rise to the application of the standard, um, show that uh, not all the the principles are identical because uh, that uh, the the principles of the um, uh, of the nature based solutions highlight. Uh, I would say three that are mainly related to topics that were not uh, were not so explicit with previous uh, approaches, like uh, the topic of um, the importance of uh, having an impact on policies. And when we discuss this, is is um, we are talking about local policies, sectorial policies, any kind of policies, uh, even global policies, as, as was already mentioned. We also. Uh, consider the topic of uh, synergies that is very important, and also the um, the trade-offs that were was already mentioned. But in this case, we understand that that we have um, ecological trade-offs as well as social trade-offs. So this topic is is extremely important, and we need to make sure that we are addressing uh, the problem in an integrated manner because uh, the experiences that we have so far have been quite fragmented uh, and this is the main concern uh, when we were discussing the relevance of implementing the nature-based solutions approach uh, uh, the need to have a connection at landscape level because usually this in many cases these approaches in the field are only focused on one specific uh, topic some ecosystem services are addressed, for example, for climate change adaptation, we mainly refer to some specific um, ecosystem services. But at the end, the integrity at landscape level is what matters, because we need to have these synergies at scale, and uh, we need to have all the stakeholders involved in this process of negotiation of um, what uh, what are the impacts if we implement one action or the other so um so this is why i think uh, this is um there is a valid uh, uh, an added value from the uh, nature based solutions approach that is not replacing in any way the um ecosystem approach. I want to insist on that because in the negotiations we have seen many uh, concerns about this. So, uh, and finally, um, the next one, please. So, uh, as presented, the MBS principles allow for the integration of solutions uh, at landscape, uh, for landscape planning and policy coherence um, in, all, in one single framework. So the, the global standard that was developed by um, IUCN uh, and with the strong uh, participation of the Commission on Ecosystem Management, uh, IUCN members who were consulted, uh, many people from the Secretariat, this is a collective effort to, in order to set a common basis of understanding of what nature-based solutions are and to provide a robust framework to design, assess, improve, and scale up and scale out nature-based solutions to better address societal challenges. And uh, it, it, was, it has been mentioned already uh, the, the importance of nature-based solutions um, as, a, as, as a tool for uh, scaling up this transformational change needed we are uh, we, we believe that this tool can really help us to address not all the uh, the let's say the conservation commitments that we have because we have a lot of experience on, on that we are concerned about what's happening outside of the protected areas and the the areas in which we have invested many years in conservation so we 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 completely agree that this import is very important to consolidate uh, 
a high percentage of protected areas, but we are we see that nature based solutions are, is the best tool to address the remaining 70%. So, um, the most relevant criteria, uh, uh, and you can see the, the importance of, of the standard is that we established 8 criteria with uh, about 36 indicators. But what is important is that all these criteria have to be addressed simultaneously because um, uh, in a way that we can address several societal challenges at the same time, not only one, because as I explained before, uh, addressing only one challenge may increase trade-offs uh, and uh, consequences in the long term. So, um, so I want to highlight that uh, some of the most relevant criteria are re related to landscape approaches. That means that um, uh, nature-based solutions should be seen as a continuum in the territory. Uh, the management of, of trade-offs is another important criteria. The incidence in policies, and it was mentioned already, the importance of addressing social and biodiversity uh, trade-offs. Uh, I want to, to conclude by uh, mentioning the the importance also to to consider that uh, uh, when we were talking about biodiversity uh, gains or uh, biodiversity requirements, we are um, talking about biodiversity gains, as was mentioned by Jane at the beginning, but also the the need to um, to promote or to achieve ecosystem integrity. This is another important topic that is included. And this is why we internally in, in, in the commission and with many other people uh, are um, uh, also advocating for the relevance of, of having an ecosystem goal uh, in, in the post 2020 uh, framework, because it's extremely, if, if we really have this uh, goal on ecosystems, we can really connect and interact with the, with the standard, with the ecosystem based approaches and, um, so far, we have um, uh, the, uh, we are proposing a theory of change to uh, to achieve this ecosystem goal that should include components like area integrity and the risk of collapse. And there is where we connect this um, nature-based solutions standard with the uh, red list of ecosystems assessment, this, which is a, a, an additional contribution to the work that IUCN has done for many years, uh, highlighting the relevance of uh, considering the uh, one ecosystem goal. So we we hope with this that the that the standard that uh, is uh, provides a common understanding and interpretation across sectors, geographies, um, that uh, we can really ensure a systematic learning framework to improve and evolve applications provide quality control in the design and execution of interventions, minimize risks related to unsustainable use of nature, use excessive relevant tools. As we said, we are not um, starting reinventing the wheel. We are really building on experiences and science uh, previously developed, but specifically oriented to achieve these goals. And, uh, we are also aiming to create a global user community, including different sectors, and at the end, contribute to a shared vision for a just and sustainable world. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jane. And Brilliant. that's it now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us that sort of extra technical background and the context and the, the wide vision, if you like, represented by nature based solutions. And I think it is helpful to see the evolution of where this has come from and and really how 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 this this piece if you like is kind of more helpful than some of the other bits it speaks more widely to the public and it's it's more intuitively understandable as long as we get it right now we have some time for questions which is excellent and we've got some very rich questions in the chat um the first one i'm going to ask to um probably all of you, and then I'm going to sort of um, take them one by one according to who I think might be the best person to to answer. So the, the first one I think is is, um, is is quite an obvious one that we hope to be asked. Um, and of course, it's that, you know, within the CBD negotiations so far, we've seen some pushback 
on the issue of nature based solutions. And um, another questioner refers to the fact that the um, uh, the, the recent um, summit in Cornwall pushed uh, didn't want to uh, include nature based solutions in the in the communicate the G7 summit. So what can we do about that right now, given time is so limited and we'll soon be heading into the key political negotiation for the global biodiversity framework. So um, I'm, going, I'm going to ask you all for your thoughts on that. And then we've got some other interesting questions, but let me start with Catalina. Can you share some advice with us on what we might be able to do or what you might be doing about that from the Secretariat point of view of the CBD? Thank you, Jane. And thank you to, to those asking those questions I think it's uh, it's definitely one that we have been seeing in the negotiations. We do realize that not only in the CBD context, but also in New York, uh, in several of the discussions addressing uh, the Rio uh, conventions, especially CBD, the term nature-based solution uh, has been kind of uh, controversial. Despite the fact that nature-based solutions has been adopted in the context of the of the climate convention, it, it was one of the um, uh, elements of the uh, Secretary General's Climate Action Summit in 2019. So there is a, a political recognition of that term within the context of the climate process. In, in terms of the CBD, I think uh, Angela did mention uh, a bit of the evolution of how in the CBD context, we use the term ecosystem based approaches and in the context of referring to climate adaptation and mitigation, we used ecosystem based approaches for uh, climate adaptation and, and mitigation purposes with a lot of uh, decisions and guidance that already exist uh, via the parties and many of the of the constituencies that have followed the, the COP discussions. My my recommendation would be that we when using the reference to nature based solutions, we also explain uh, how the CBD has been approaching this through the term ecosystem based approaches and providing examples that not only address the context under climate change, but also as mentioned previously that describe these uh, type of um, approaches, activities towards the sustainable development uh, agenda, in which case we know that uh, solutions coming from ecosystems and from nature are well placed in uh, SDG 2 on agriculture, uh, SDG uh, 11 on, on climate change itself, uh, the SDGs on, on and infrastructure and many others. Uh, we also, I think um, there there are there are aspects where we need to operationalize the, and explain again the different tools that the CBD has um, developed, and demonstrate how this has been used uh, by uh, countries as well as at the local level, so that there's more reference about what is being explained and how it's applicable in 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 the context of the CBD as well as understanding how the term is being defined by IUCN and other um, other partners, uh, not only for the context of climate change, but also how it's applicable for the post-2020 framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. So so who else would like to comment on, on the answer to this question or give us, or those listening to this, any advice on how it might be um, further pushed. I mean, one one thing perhaps I will say to, to, to Corley is maybe we need to explain how your big vision aligns to the nature based solution standard of IUCN. And I don't know if that piece of work has been done, but that might also help. Did you make a comment on that, Corley? Um, well, do you, yeah, I can make a comment on that. I, I mean, it is not, um, I don't think that it would implement anything other than that it's not sort of going off into a different standard or a different direction it's really in providing the institutional support and the capacity oh, right, to right. deliver on this on the ground that's the one part and the other part is connecting the dots so making sure that you also bring nature-based solutions beyond the environment sector to make it relevant to agriculture as Catalina said to make it relevant across the different SDGs and that is sort of the purpose of the, the the mainstreaming approach. Right. So maybe one, I think we, we need to see a sort of route towards making this acceptable to governments and others who perhaps this is still a new concept to. Maybe we all need to explain it all a little bit about how it all aligns and you know, reassure people that it's not a greenwash to be direct, you know, reassure people that it's 
it doesn't do harm. It does good. And it, it does good for people at the same time as doing good for biodiversity. I mean, I'm putting it deliberately very, very simply because it's a technical subject, but we need to make it accessible to people. And um, who else would like to comment on this? Um, if I can come in, please. Thank you. Sure. And uh, well, uh, as uh, uh, the lead negotiator in, in these conventions and in G20, I have just seen that um, that pushback. Uh, but um, I mean, in every convention, in every negotiation, at some point, uh, a concept has been new and not because it hasn't been yet discussed, we can't put it in the table. I mean, if not, then we would never advance. And, and so, I mean, that uh, I don't believe it's a valid argument on going forward that just simply uh, because we haven't agreed yet, then we shouldn't incorporate it. And it's just we need to, as they are pushing back, then we need to push forward. I mean, um, and uh, in 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 every field, it's uh, it's uh, take making sure that, uh, as as you said, um, we are showing the the benefits of nature based solutions. We're we're showing with concrete examples uh, what we mean by nature based solutions, and then uh, put on the table then a definition for us to work on. But if we don't even ask it, then it will never get agreed. So it's just, again, insist and insist in every forum uh, on what we see uh, uh, that nature-based solutions are and what is the value added of, of this concept. Just Brilliant. That's, I think that's great advice, actually, because everything was new once. So I yeah. think you know, to keep insisting and also explaining. Um, any other comments on this question? Yes. Uh, if I may, uh, Jane. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the question is important and uh, well, I would respond based on my experience in, in some projects, especially um, uh, regarding ecosystem based adaptation. For example, I've been one of the of the main advocates for, for promoting ecosystem based adaptation to address climate change. But what I, I've seen and, and that was discussed a couple of years ago in, in the climate change dis discussions or um, uh, regarding the, the contributions of, of EBA and some of the of the main challenges that we identify is, for example, to highlight the connection with biodiversity, because uh, the, in many cases, and I want to insist that this is one of the, I wouldn't say failures, but the limitations of uh, applying these uh, ecosystem based approaches we, without this integrated picture. So we, we the, the projects or these initiatives uh, didn't have um, the possibility to deliver or to uh, results on biodiversity, for example, because in many cases they have seen, uh, they have been seen as, um, um, let's say, um, yeah, uh, like uh, some of the some benefits or co-benefits, but not embedded in the definition. So, uh, and in many cases, uh, if you see a territory, the area in which the ecosystem-based adaptation project was implemented, lack of a connection with other land use activities. So this is something that I think that the NBS standard provides a tool to, to link and to integrate because it's not just about nature-based solutions for climate. We, we have in the definition nature-based solutions for human health, for water provision, for agriculture, and the ideal situation is to have all these um, uh, challenges addressed in an integrated manner, not just say now uh, and starting using the language nature based solutions for climate, nature based solutions for agriculture, because then we are again fragmenting the responses. And this is one of the topics that we would like to avoid and in which I think that the MBS standard contributes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's an in important point to stress, really. This fully integrated approach, which I think the, the UN whole of UN approach is also aiming to achieve. Um, so just just moving on. Um, how do we implement nature based solutions on the ground level? I mean, that's quite a technical question. And I think the best thing to do there is is 
And um, I mean, I, Andrew, I don't know if you could give a short answer to that, but there's a lot of information on the IUCN website, isn't there? Um, and uh, including, you know, a sort of guide to the standard and how to implement it. Could you could you give us a sort of short piece of advice on on that for the questioner who asked that question? Yeah, well, uh, it's important to highlight that the NBS standard is, uh, um, let's say, the main audience for the nature based uh, solutions standard is includes the policy level, something that is we expect to 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 get um, a commitment and um, from from the policy sector, uh, making sure that the um, the nature based solutions standard is adopted at policy level as well. That is something that uh, it, it's, it refers to one of the criteria and uh, in most of the other previous um, approaches that I mentioned is not highly is not visible in in that way. So I think that that's one important contribution. Another one is uh, and it's another component of the of the audience is the private sector. Uh, because, as I mentioned, we aim to to engage them to to make them part of the of this web of uh, connections, and uh, uh, and the, the the final one is uh, let's say the traditional one, the one that is related to projects and actions that are in, in many cases uh, developed and sponsored by the GF and other multilateral or bilateral uh, cooperation. So, I, I, because at the end, if we, what we aim is to have um, MBS adopted at landscape level, we need to engage everyone. We, we cannot just focus in only one component or only one um, uh, stakeholder. We need to have all of them in the uh, sitting together in, in, the, in the table and discussing uh, about these trade-offs and, and making sure that that all the decisions are shared and discussed with, with all the participants. Great, thank you. Um, so, I mean, building on what you say there, and this relates to another question, you know, pointing out that, um, I mean, we're speaking in English and English, the reach of English in the world is only so far. Will um, there be a, a big multilingual capacity building effort or a mass public outreach program by IUCN and the UN? I mean, I would say this speaks to Angela's answer. If, if it becomes part of the post 2020 framework, this is a framework for parties to implement. But we also hope other sectors will play their part. In, and, and as Norbert has been stressing, um, other conventions as well. Um, it's a framework for all, as certainly IUCN envisages it, and that's our position. Um, Corley, would you like to add on what, what the UN system might be doing to push this out a little bit more to the public? Um, yes, thank you, Jane. Uh, as I sort of alluded or hinted, um, as part of the common approach, um, to biodiversity, there's certainly a, a component that relates to global advocacy um, and communications and outreach around mainstreaming biodiversity and nature-based solutions. So this is, we realize that there are many parts for this to, to be successfully integrated or mainstreamed and for these transitions to also find political resonance. There's a very large job to be done in reaching out to key stakeholders and audiences and make them part of, of the solution. I think it's important looking at the multiple benefits of, of um, restoration and of nature based solutions is to be able to articulate what are those societal benefits that you can generate through applying these um, approaches by resetting our relationship with nature. And that I think is a, there's an enormous um, awareness raising task in all languages um, and in all countries to be able to achieve this. Thank you. I think this is the importance also of reaching city dwellers where so many of us live these days. Um, I would just like to ask Norbert. Norbert, you mentioned um, mainstreaming, obviously, and, and we've got a, a question on, you know, what would it take on, on the na at the national level? I mean, perhaps not just in Switzerland, but wider. You know, how can we mainstream nature based solutions more effectively? I mean, not just for climate change, but, you know, for as Angela's pointed out, this is for 
all societal challenges that link to nature. What is? Uh, can you give us any advice? It's a challenge. I remember the last two COPs of the CBD. Uh, they were um, under the um, title of uh, mainstreaming biodiversity and we didn't have any other ministers showing up. So uh, the other ministers, they know that they will be blamed and criticized uh, for not integrating uh, nature and, and biodiversity into their policies. Um, so uh, it, remains, it remains a challenge, but um, as it has been said also, the cost of inaction uh, is probably higher than the cost of um, action. And this has to be um integrated in 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 policy programs i, I guess that uh, cabinets they have to discuss this and they have to understand that um we have to have a um, not only within the UN system, we have to have a common approach, but also within a government, uh, we have to have this uh, this approach and uh, to discuss um, among each other. And there are many, many ways how we can uh, work together. I, in Switzerland, we have a lot of avalanches, so we know that we have to keep the trees so that prevents landslides and, and, and snow avalanches. Um, in my area that I grew up, um, they build a lot of um, they straightened all this, the, the riverbeds and um, they put dams against uh, flooding and um, now they understood that maintaining these dams or rebuild these dams is much more expensive than just to let land around the rivers that can be from time to time if there is flooding uh, it can be underwater but there are a lot of plants who can scope with this and so uh, this also protects then farms that are a little bit far away from from the river you don't necessarily need to have uh, infrastructure and this becomes more and more i guess evident in in the governments that they have to uh, exchange among each other and um, first think of of um, solutions that are um, in harmony with, with nature to, uh, uh, to to talk about this uh, nice vision 2050 of the CBD. Great, thanks Norbert. We're going to be counting on Switzerland to show us how it's done, I think. Um, okay, so this brings us to the really fun point in the afternoon or morning or the evening, wherever you are. Um, we're going to ask each of our panelists to give us their main takeaway message and um you each have a minute so <laughs> i'm looking forward to this bit catalina could we please start with you what's your main takeaway message well th thank you jane i think there was many points that came up i i did want to echo a, a quick uh, reflection on the last question uh, in view of the economic analyses and the cost benefits when it comes to the different trade-offs on a landscape uh, but in in uh, in my final point, I think the takeaway is that it is critical for the nature based solutions um, uh, operational kind of next steps to leverage broad action across all uh, actors and sectors of society to mainstream the value of biodiversity and to enhance and restore the function functionality of ecosystems on which socioeconomic activity depends. And at the same time, recognizing and reducing the negative impacts on human activity uh, with the aim to enable a virtuous cycle, one that reduces the loss and degradation of biodiversity and enhances human well being. So that would be my takeaway is that balance and that necessity to really mainstream uh, this vision to operationalize what we need to do between now and 2030 and how we get to our vi uh, vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. Thank you. Excellent. I wish we had longer for the reply because um, it would be good for you to elaborate a little bit more on how that could be done at some point. But that's a really interesting answer. Thank you. Um, Norbert, over to you. I think you're muted. Thank you. Sorry for that. My dog was barking, so I had to mute uh, my microphone. <laughs> um, and um, the dog is a symbol for uh, someone who um, pays attention to nature. Uh, they feel all the different uh, odors and they can uh, smell uh, all the different. Very important, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we will have to, to go a little bit back in, in this, uh, this direction to, to understand nature, to feel. Um, and um, for me, the harmony that um, 
that Kalina was mentioning has to do with balance. And balance for me means also that we should, um, and this is the element of the transformative change, we should not just have a GDP that focuses on money and, and our economic value. And we should certainly not accept trade with products that are cheaper because they do not respect any social standards and they do, uh, um, do harm. To have a, we have to integrate these elements, social standards, environment standards, and uh, with, when everybody respects this, then we can have a fair free trade and competition, but only if uh, the standards are respected. And uh, this is something that uh, yeah, is, is important for, for nature as, as such, not necessarily with nature-based solution, but uh, for the CBD uh, framework, I guess. Great. Thank you. I mean, that would be another interesting discussion to have to look at the trade in import and export of threats to biodiversity, but um, another day perhaps. Um, <laughs> so now let's move to, to Camilla, please. Thank you very much. And uh, just uh, on, on this last questions, I think that the reflection is that uh, we need to, to show all this technical work that we have been doing and uh, showcase the co-benefits of nature-based solutions and, and value added as uh, this will be key um, to make sure that uh, all of these different forces uh, that are pushing back against nature-based solutions, uh, that uh, they, they, they see that we're not meaning a greenwashing a concept, but that actually this contributes uh, for, the, uh, for the ultimate purpose, which is uh, to tackle um, uh, climate change and reduce uh, our loss of biodiversity and, and loss of bio of desertification. And, and in that, that sense, um, Financial resources are needed, and because they are needed, we need uh, to make sure that they go to the most cost-effective um, uh, solutions. And we we do believe that nature-based solutions are are such. And so um, now it, it's up to us uh, uh, to to make sure that we are um, uh, sort of attracting private investment and public investment uh, towards uh, this and and. Only with concrete examples and with real evidence, we will make it as so. So uh, that that's an important step going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely agree with all that. Certainly, um, Corley, please. Thank you, Jane. At the um, we're very UN esque. At the UN Biodiversity Summit last year, the message was, you know, the next decade is our last chance to transform our relationship with um, with nature. And it's not to be a sort of um, doomsday, but we are really now reaching levels of degradation that is putting our economies and our financial system, livelihoods, social fabric at risk. So the next decade, very much along what uh, Catalina said, is the decade where we need to transform our societies. More of the good stuff, more nature-based solutions, more integrated approaches, and less of the harmful stuff that's degrading nature, whether in your own country or through those supply chains in other countries. So there's a lot of work that we can do around that, raising awareness, transparency, but also investing in the more sustainable solutions. So it's a job for all of us. It's not someone else's job. It's not someone else's business. Each of us can play a role in that. No, thank you for that. And uh, I'm glad you said all that because actually sometimes we have to convince ourselves to keep saying it. And sometimes we get tired of ourselves saying it, but we have to keep saying it and we have to keep plugging away. So I'm really glad you said all that. Thank you. Um, Angela, finally, please. Last but by no means least. What is your one minute takeaway? I was muted. Uh, well, I, I would say uh, and perhaps repeat uh, that um, the ecosystem approach and and ecosystem-based approaches and nature-based solutions uh, are not competing. They complement one to each other and provide scientific and operational tools to achieve the transformational change, as was mentioned. And nature-based solutions is really a very good tool and has a strong potential to grow and to reach the relevance of ecosystem-based approaches at landscape level, seeking for integration. I want to insist on that, mm, uh, promoting and in integrating ecosystem-based actions in the field, minimizing trade-offs and promoting uh, the existence of sustainable and resilient territories. So we are uh, with a new standard and we really hope 
that this can contribute to establish communities of practice beyond conservation and uh, reaching out really um, sectors such as agriculture, human health, and all the and, and cities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, we're just about bang on time. So let me thank um, all of our panelists and for some really interesting and thought provoking presentations. And I think they've all complemented each other beautifully. And I've certainly learned a lot. So it's been great. And I think we've got to all keep going and show how nature based solutions can contribute to a nature positive, climate neutral, equitable world. And now I'll hand back to Diana. Thank you. Thanks to Thank our you. audience, I should Thank add. You. Yes, thanks to our audience, thanks to our panelists, and thanks to our moderator. Thank you very much, Jane. I just wanted to add a few words on um, the, the next steps in our journey. And as you will see in the next slide, uh, the next session will be, we have done some accommodations to the, to the series, and the next session will be in August with our colleagues from the International Labour Organization, where we'll be discussing socioeconomic growth and nature-based solutions. Um, I also want to mention here, as you will see in the next slide, that this is part of a journey with many more uh, sessions and you can find more information uh, on the website. Also, all the outcomes of these sessions, uh, the summaries, the videos, everything, and the links of the documents that were presented, everything is being made available on, on the website. 